Welcome back, everyone. Again, I'm David Hamilton, founder and chairman of the America's Future Series, and I'm thrilled to be here uh, with a group of uh, some of the nation's leading uh, defense innovation unit leaders, uh, people who are at the forefront of putting capabilities in the hands of the warfighter faster, which is what this entire dual use technology summit is about. So it's great that we can have these minds together and for them to share some of their insights. And I'm gonna introduce them first, they'll tell you a little bit about themselves, et cetera, and then we're gonna have a, a little discussion amongst them uh, about their organizations, maybe uh, what they do, how they differ, and, and how they maybe are the same and how they work together. So first, uh, to my left, I'd like to uh, talk, to, uh, introduce you all to uh, Noam Oz of EnableX. I think you're the director of product de uh, product development, is that right? Or yes, sir. Okay, great, I've got Brigadier General uh, Ahern with the Army Applications Lab, thrilled to have you here uh, as well, and Leslie uh, Babich, who leads uh, uh, Softworks. So this is a great representation of, uh, of the different, uh, uh, some, we don't have all the forces here, but I think we've got enough of it for a quorum, right? Anyway, so thank you so much. So if you would, uh, Noam, tell us a little about yourself, what you all do, et cetera, and we'll go down the line. Sure, so first off, thank you very much, David, for hosting this, and a pleasure and a privilege to be here on International Women's Day with two very accomplished <laughs> women, so thank you. Uh, I serve as the Deputy Director for Product Development uh, for Naval X, Naval primarily hinting at both Navy and Marine Corps. So we serve uh, as the innovation operations cell for both services. Uh, in addition to several years in the private sector, uh, working on my 15th year in, the, uh, in civil service, primarily as an acquisition professional. Great, it's a great perspective. Uh, General? Hi, so Stephanie Ahern. And so unfortunately, I am not in charge of the Army Application Lab, but oh, I'm part of Army Futures I, Command. So, uh, um, uh, but I really very much appreciate being here. So Army Futures Command, which does have the Army, Army Applications Lab and gets to deal with, uh, with Leslie and Noam quite often. Um, so our job is to help transform the Army to be ready for that future war winning readiness. Um, and so part of that is how are we taking technologies today to get it to the future war fighters? Um, how are we using research across the s and community? Um, I am specifically the director of concepts. So we get to work every day with s and experts, with threat experts, with analysis uh, analysts, people working law of armed conflict, um, and so we're looking for how are Army forces working with the Navy, working with the, the special operations with the Air Force, through all the monitor, um, uh, how are we going to have to do our missions in 2040 based off of that changing environment? Um, and so that feels like it's a long ways away. Um, but I think for, for a host of reasons, we're trying to make sure that we're ready now for what's coming. Brilliant, wonderful. Thank you so much, Leslie. All right. Hey, thank you so much again for also you know bringing us together to be able to collaborate as innovation organizations because we don't always get the opportunity to do that. We're very focused on working with small non traditional businesses and you know solutions providers, but I think this is a great opportunity as well. So thank you. Um, so Softworks is a um, nonprofit entity underneath the Defense Works Innovation Hub umbrella, and our goal is to really lower the barrier of entry for small non-traditional companies and solutions providers from academia, um, laboratories, startups to engage with Special Operations Command um, and the end user and the warfighter to see if they have solutions for the challenges that SOCOM is facing. Um, and again, we do the low barrier of entry and it's it's a slightly different tool, but I think, I think it's really important to have multiple tools in the toolbox. And so kind of our focus area is lowering the barrier of entry in terms of location, you know, we're off base, it's easy to get to, having unclassified projects so that companies and people without clearances can also um, interface with our government stakeholders. And then also we execute commercial agreements. So if they're not quite ready to execute a commercial or a, a far base contract, um, that they can still dip their toe in the water and share their capability and then progress towards that um, desired end state. And again, I think all of us are very focused on delivering capability to the warfighter and accelerated pace in the light of technology development and the speed um, and kind of getting inside that um, battle rhythm of far base contracting to mitigate the risk in terms of cost and technology solutions before we get to that production stage. So there are a lot of different innovation organizations um, and I think you all share a lot in common, but I imagine there are some differences. So what would you say uh, are, are sort of the universal common denominators between all of you, and maybe what's different about e each of yours relative maybe to some of the other ones? Uh, whoever would like to go first would be great. I can take that first. I think, again, we all have that common goal. Um, I think where we differ is 
kind of our focus area is really that technology readiness level for that minimum viable product all the way through commercial off the shelf. We don't focus on the early stage research. Um, that is really kind of a SOCOM in a lab um, type of responsibility. And again, um, the commercial agreements, I think, are something that is slightly different than uh, the rest of the organizations. In general? So I think we're all about solving problems. Mm -hmm. And so I think you know, the, the Army Applications Lab, um, but we're focused on often problems that the Army soldiers are having, making sure that we're working with the Navy uh, and our other partners, because often it's not just the, the soldiers that are seeing this problem. But I think you know, what we provide for the joint force is something that we're trying to make sure that we're solving, uh, but in many of the, the similar ways that our partners are doing. Yeah, I would add that I think that the common thread among us is that we all recognize that the pace of threat on the global stage is moving more rapidly than what traditional acquisition pathways uh, are able to keep up with. And so we're all trying to get after delivering of capabilities that address immediate needs quickly while laying a foundation toward supporting that long-term strategy. Uh, and then the differences among us, which I think really add to diversity and the, the good complexity within the infrastructure across the services is how we are structured. So as an example, Naval X is benefited by having both an arm that focuses and engages directly with the end users, the sailors and Marines to source the needs that they have mm -hmm. today beyond large material like platforms such as carriers and submarines and weapon systems. But we also have a broad tech bridge network, mm -hmm. geographically dispersed across the nation, as well as a few international sites where we are cultivating uh, ecosystems for innovation across industry, academia, and the Naval Research and Development Establishment in order to bring in and introduce non-traditional companies and solution providers, welcome them into the fold and help them remove some of those barriers of entry while facilitating pathways that enable them to broaden their business portfolio while equipping our warfighters with the capabilities they need. So you reach out to uh, all the non-traditional, uh, non-standard um, uh, solutions providers, and you, like you should try to welcome in. in. Um, so how would you say it would be best for one of these providers that would like to, an aspiring solution provider who wants to be part of the fight, and connect with the right people, either connect with money, connect with the, and, and hear what your needs are, right? Because you know, you're going to the voice of the customer, you're, you're going after the sailor, marine, airman, et cetera. Um, how can they best engage with you? How can they first sort of enter your pipeline, connect with you, et cetera? And what advice would you give them in, in terms of working with each of your organizations? So, yeah, I'll, I'll start. So yeah. uh, from a, a Naval X perspective, best way to get connected with us, just go to usnavalx.com, mm -hmm. join our network. The, okay. the button's right there. Uh, we then connect you with the appropriate elements or business line. You have an intake person or team. We have a team. We, we have a whole infrastructure designed to welcome these, uh, these solution providers who want to explore what is it like to do business with the de defense department. Mm -hmm. uh, and then depending on what their aspirations are, we, we tailor the approach with them. Now, there are several avenues that we explore. Uh, the Department of the Navy Cyber program mm -hmm. also falls under Naval X. So that's always an avenue that we explore to get small businesses into the fold. Uh, but we also partner with InQtel mm -hmm. in order to identify other avenues for them to, uh, to enter. Uh, and we also partner regularly with the Office of Strategic Capital in order to identify avenues for applied capital to help some of the, co uh, the companies and solution providers who may not be familiar uh, with how to get in, how to negotiate the language of the government. Mm. And we we try to serve really as a Rosetta Stone to translate in both directions of that equation. Mm -hmm. And this is similar for the yes. your two organizations as well as a similar model and it how is. people connect and, and how the services you provide? Yes. For us, um, so softworks.org, um, if you join our ecosystem, <laughs> um, what we try and do is push opportunities out to folks because um, trying to navigate sam.gov can be difficult, especially if you're not familiar with it. Um, the same thing for the CIBR website. So we have kind of two pathways that we look at, um, solutions looking for problems and problems looking for solutions. So uh, when SOCOM brings us uh, a problem they're trying to solve, that's when we kind of reach out through our collaboration events and our assessment events 
to identify companies that have those potential solutions. We do a lot of market research um, and try and bring them in again for engagement opportunities with the SOCOM for fighters and enablers. So again, we're trying to push to push so push opportunities out as well as pull people in. So if by chance your company doesn't have a solution that falls under one of those identified technology areas, and we get them in probably three to four times a month that we're doing events to find particular solutions or problems that we're trying to solve. If it doesn't fall under that, you can push your technology in um, either through a Softworks Tech Tuesday mechanism, doing business with SOCOM as well. They have a website where there's several different avenues where they can push technologies in because again, there's some great stuff out there if it's not something specifically that they're looking for, we don't want to miss it. We want to be able to get them exposure to their technologies um, to a government only audience um, because we do, we are, you know, protective of folks IP. We understand that's a concern for startups and small businesses in particular. Um, and so we want to provide them a protected way of sharing their technology with the warfighter. Brilliant. And I think from an Army perspective, Army Futures Command and the Army Applications Lab down at the Capitol Factory, so here in Austin. Um, but I also think just, you know, in addition to what my colleague said, the the also the link that we have with academia um, and those, and I know that it, it works the, the same as well. There's many different ways if Americans are wanting to help to be able to advance problems that they're seeing, hearing. You, we've got obviously the, the broad agency announcements and those types of things. Finding ways to help us identify you know, different approaches. Here's the problem. What are additional ways that we can go after it? And so it's in, you know, sharing information across the services. Right. Well. And your website is? It's at Army Futures Command. Great for Command people. <laughs> All right. So make sure you, if you're an aspiring non-standard traditional, you just have to go to them. They will take care of you, right? And, and connect you. Yeah. Um, you know, um, the need for this is exacerbated or highlighted by the fact that we have so many conflicts right now, with the Ukrainian mm -hmm. war, et cetera, and all of this. Stuff. So, so are there things that you guys are learning and things that are coming out of the recent conflicts, et cetera, that are either driving needs or maybe uh, highlighting um, certain technologies, capabilities, et cetera, that we need more? That, and, and that's from the voice of the customer, the, our, 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 our men and women at the front. Uh, is that filtering back and are, are you, are you guys are, have a, a means of addressing those things? I'll ask you, Jill. So, uh, yes, <laughs> it would be the short answer. So, I mean, I do think one, and again, because of where I'm coming from, and I'll definitely from the specifics of technology, but um, both the technology and how it's being used is changing really fast. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it from just the act of war, and I'm just going to talk here about Ukraine, um, but uh, the... It, Things that we were starting three and a half years ago about what we thought might be in the realm of the possible, we're already seeing some of those things today. And so just trying to make sure that there is a real need for, for change to happen. Um, and so how are people that have new approaches with new technology to help empower soldiers to, to uh, survive and to be able to achieve what they need on the battlefield is real. Um, I would say also that you know, in addition to the technology, um, how militaries use the technology and how they fight is quite different. And so as we're looking for um, what soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines are going to need to do, Coast Guardsmen, in 2040, the larvam conflict and the ethics, mm -hmm. um, what we expect our soldiers and, and service members to do in 2040 may not be what others do. And that doesn't mean we replicate it, but we have to make sure that we understand how do we mitigate some of those problems. So that's mm -hmm. some of the things we're also looking at. Um, and the other thing, again, less specific to technology, but te technology absolutely helps, is that having the will to fight really matters. How you use that technology and the support you get from Americans and others is also really, really important. Um, and so, again, we're not intending to empty out our jails anytime soon mm -hmm. um, to be able to have that. And so how we're using technology so that it's only what humans must do is something that we're also really trying to look at. Yeah, I, I'd like you to uh, chime in on that, but, but this whole idea of using, putting our men and women in harm's way less by using technology, yes. uh, it seems to be absolutely yeah. central, right? Yes. Um, I would say just the conflicts don't necessarily highlight specific technology focus areas, but I think it it shows you when there is a forcing function, like how, how they are um, iterating on the development and use of those technologies and, and how important that is, not just yeah. in a combat, type of uh, environment, but in general, that's how we should be doing things is, okay, let's take it out, let's test it, did it work, did it not work, let's make some quick changes. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of these um, you know, organizations support 
rapid innovation and iteration, not just, you know, we've got some thresholds and objectives and we're driving straight to that, but it allows for development of technology and to modify in accordance with how that technology is developing. So I think that's, to me, the most important thing that I'm seeing coming out of those conflicts. And you, sir? Yeah, so I think the general hit it on the head when she referenced Ukraine. Ukraine, especially from a naval perspective, has opened up a whole new aperture when we consider uncrewed systems. And now, after seeing that play out, counter unmanned systems, mm -hmm. uncrewed systems. Uh, so from a naval X perspective, we have team members who are positioned to engage directly with our fleets around the globe. In particular, right now, for the current conflicts, we have them positioned for Sixth Fleet in Europe, Fifth Fleet in the Middle East, and in PAC Fleet. And in doing so, we engage with them to understand not what their large material platform requirements are, but rather what their capability needs are. Mm. And then we, by sourcing those, we distill those problem sets and needs into uh, curated problem statements that we can then tap into a variety of resources, TechBridge Network, the Naval Research and Development Establishment, as well as uh, academia, and other partners across the DODX community innovation cells throughout the enterprise. Uh, the other angle is we recognize that at this point, the industry is able to move with R&D at a faster pace than we are internally. We are dependent on our industry partners. Mm -hmm. And so what we try to do is not necessarily change the rules of the game for them, but rather embrace their rules in terms of entrepreneurship uh, and venture investment in order to offer opportunities for non-traditionals to bring their products into the hands of the warfighter and get opportunity to get direct feedback from sailors and Marines to inform their business decisions on whether they want mm -hmm. to invest in a new product line, modifications, or determine that it's not the right fit for them at that time. Mm -hmm. So I was wanting to get to that, but you've kind of touched on it, this idea, is it getting better? How um, the DOD, how the procurement process, of course, Congress, you, you guys have 535 board members, right? Uh, called congressmen and women, et cetera, right? That, that help you decide how to spend the money, what to spend it on, et cetera. And even whether you get it or not. Um, so um, is it getting better? Are we knocking down some of these barriers? Is innovation easier to do today than it was maybe say five years ago? Um, uh, you know, is the is the procurement process getting more agile, more nimble, less, you know, bureaucratic, or are many of these same problems the same? And if so, any any shining examples of, of what's working? And I'll let any of you guys who are brave enough to tackle that. So from the Softworks perspective, we don't really ever get into mass production of anything. That is a, a decision made by SOCOM mm. after a capability has gone to the prototype stage. And then they're like, yep, this is great. Or nope, chuck it to the side. Um, but they can, we can help them make educated decisions in terms of what moves forward, what gets integrated into the existing platforms, might create you know, a new program of record. Um, what, what I see, and I know there's a lot of focus on scale and manufacturing, mm -hmm. Um, I think that, so companies get to a prototype stage, but if you've ever been in a company where they design and they have to go to full rate production within that same company, focus on design for test. So you've got your design, but how you design is really important. So designing for test and designing for manufacture so that a company could then take it to scale quickly and more cost effectively in the long run. So a little bit more focus maybe on that particular area, I think is very helpful to companies that aren't used to doing that in terms of getting their capability to scale and identifying those resources that they could leverage um, to help them with that, I think is um, something that I think we can probably help as well, kind of where we're at and kind of tying those companies that look like they have some potential to move forward. Hey, take a look at these, um, you know, things that you need to consider when you're into your design phase um, before you move. So, so Joan, I think uh, the two of you uh, might've had some comments, thoughts yeah. on that. Uh, sure. Yeah. So I'll say I think the there is improvement. Um, I think Congress recognizes that there's a need for us, in addition to the established uh, acquisition, defense acquisition system, there's a need to develop and deliver capabilities uh, that are not exquisite and equip our warfighters more uh, faster, 
more expeditiously. And we're seeing that both in terms of the local level with our tech bridges. So uh, our tech bridges engage local government uh, in order to bring them into the fold, into the discussions. And so we're seeing uh, some consideration when they identify funding for infrastructure that enables the, the capabilities that we are trying to facilitate and enable on behalf of our warfighters. But we're also hopeful to see congressional language uh, at the DOD level, at the, at the, at the broad uh, agency level that supports uh, through resourcing all of our uh, agency departments and offices to really get at the heart of uh, this faster development uh, cycle time. And, and I would just add that the, the beauty in this is that it's not a this or that. Yes, we are competing with uh, limited resources and constraints to manage a high level set of broad, uh, broad and eclectic priorities. That being said, by investing upfront in research and development and allowing for failure and learning through that mm -hmm. failure, we are actually buying down risk for the culminating programs that result from developing capabilities for these needs that then translate into formal requirements that are well informed. Yeah. So you failed early, hopefully, early yes. often. So, and yes, learn. And learn from it. <laughs> Don't just keep repeating it. Yeah, well said. So I think as far as the question is, in, is innovation easier than, say, five years ago? I mean, full stop, yes. Um, I, I do think, so we had a one of uh, a former staffer that, you know, one of the ideas is maybe it's not just laptops that should have built-in obsolescence. Uh, and so we obviously very large programs that you know, we need to have all the checks, but continuing to work with Congress, and I think that they continue to try to help. The only thing that I'd say is, is that it's not just a congressional authorities challenge for innovation, um, and that I think processes, culture, and, and being able to have leaders that are allowing us to kind of push in the, you know, what, what could, what should, working with scientists, working with threat folks. And so I think it's, there's also changes, Army Futures Command is, is allowing us to work within bureaucracy, but to change bureaucracy. And so I think mm. that there's additional ways that we're trying to work, um, getting help from Congress um, it, whenever we can, but also not just expecting it's an outside problem for us not being able to move faster. I add just a little bit on sure. this. So I, I completely agree with that. I think a lot of it has to do with us in the service components, understanding the authorities that have been entrusted to us and exercising them to their fullest extent and uh, enabling this culture shift throughout the traditional acquisition system so that they also recognize it's not a threat, but rather an aid to you. Uh, and having that top leadership support those endeavors I think is critical to our success across the board. Yeah. So culture for me, it's always into this, this idea comes up. And for me, uh, I was a compensation reward theory consultant early on in my career. And the old joke is be careful what you pay for, you'll get it, right? <laughs> so one thing we don't pay uh, people in the procurement process uh, uh, world to do is take a lot of risks unnecessarily, you know, they, they want to be prudent, smart. They don't want to show favoritism and all these kinds of stuff. So there's a lot of things and, um, you know, um, you know, the, you don't want to get in trouble, right? There, 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 there's a lot of, you know, uh, I don't want to get in trouble because we, we're we spending this taxpayer's money. We're trying to do it wisely, et cetera, trying to do it fairly uh, and safely. Yes. But that can somewhat be an anathema to innovation and risk-taking, right? So um, I don't know, you know, I don't know what we do. I, the, the old joke also was that patent couldn't be in procurement. Right. Can you imagine if Patton is an early as an officer, you know, when he helped him develop the tank, right? He put uh, machine guns on the backs of uh, Tim Lizzie's uh, and, and run, ran around the Mexican desert. And <laughs> I don't think he went through a process, um, the same sort of process to develop that. I think he said, no, get a machine gun and put it on the back of the Smuddle T Ford, right? Um, how do we incentivize and how do we make it OK for the people who have this responsibility to feel like it's okay for them to fail and, and, and not jeopardize their careers. And I know this is not what you guys do every day. These are people you have, to, this is part of the process overall. So I would offer that the, the beauty in what we provide is an opportunity to serve as that uh, investment in risk reduction, where a program office is traditionally focused on executing the requirements bestowed upon it by Congress through appropriations uh, and the NDAA, we, they are focused on managing cost, schedule, and performance. 
they're not looking to assume a lot of risk in the development, right? The, the requirements need to be fully vetted by that point. And there's also an aversion to change. In the R&D world, we, we're not focused on program management, we're focused on product development, which is very solving and right, amenable to welcoming that risk because that helps inform those requirements on the back end. So because you do, exist, it makes their job easier exactly. and they're more likely to actually take a risk and, and, or well, de-risk the situation we, for them. Exactly. It's, it's the latter there where we engage the program offices and the resource sponsors early so that they know what we're looking at and the problem sets that we're, we're trying to curate and solve and see how they fit well and organically into their portfolios and bring them in early to the discussion so that we also can inform mm -hmm. all of the 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 product lines that they have to the products rather that they have to develop in order to be whole on their cost schedule performance analyses. We are buying down the risk on the R&D side so that they can execute a program of record with certainty in, in the execution of the performance and meeting the schedule needs. So I think so. three different things. So one is, is that we have to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. We, we have to make sure we're being safe outside of conflict. Like, uh, but, but I'd say that from an Army Futures Command and an Army perspective, there's been a lot of work on the requirements process of like, how do you make sure we're not saying that we have this 80 page document that we want industry to make? How do we you know, make sure that that the upfront part is is working much more efficiently? Soldier touch points, you know, Americans are, are innovative in genius people. And so how do we get something and then allow soldiers to play with it? Be like, that's the dumbest idea. How do you make it simpler? Here's what I could do with it. The other thing I think from an army perspective um, from our chief is, is that you have the transformation in contact. So what army application labs and what, you know, how do we make changes right now, the now to two years, the deliberate transformation. So our normal process, you know, now through about 2030, going through like the standard process. And then we're at that concept driven and transformation where we're not actually bound by this normal process, but we're informed by it. And how do we leap forward? And by having three separate time periods, I think, you know, how do you leverage the different strengths of each? And that's what our approach to transformation across. I would say um, partnership intermediary agreements are a great discussion on culture and risk. Um, if you ever read PIA Authority, um, it's very <laughs> nondescript. It's about two paragraphs long. And it's not very specific to what you, like how you do things, how you can and cannot do things. So PIAs were established, you know, a few decades ago to enable government labs to take the technologies that they've researched and developed and spin them out into the commercial space. And so SOCOM back in, uh, I would say 2012, 2013, uh, with the, the Honorable Hondo Gertz um, and Admiral Craven at the time, took a look at the PIA authority and how it was originally being used said, you know what, this is also a great mechanism for us to be able to take technologies that are being developed in the commercial space and bring them in. And so the PIA authority does not say that you cannot execute commercial agreements. It doesn't specifically say you can, but SOCOM took a look at the risk and the benefits that would, um, you know, executing commercial agreements with non-traditionals would provide and said, you know what, this is a pathway, let's go explore it. And so you talk about the use of taxpayer dollars. I think we have excellent documentation processes in terms of all of our projects and where the dollars go. The decisions are made by our government stakeholders in terms of technical decisions um, and milestone decision. You know, you pay the company, they met their milestones, et cetera. So I think as you're, you know, you're doing something that doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily specified, but you're doing it in the, doing it in the way that provides value to the warfighter and to the business with very good documentation, you know, you mitigate the risk in terms of technology development and the cost and, you know, making sure that the taxpayer dollars are spent wisely. So I think, uh, you know, SOCOM, I think is, um, I'm a big fan of the risk culture, both as a prior operator mm -hmm. and um, as a partner in Softworks to um, do things differently. And because those commercial agreements, I think are part of the magic that we have because of the speed that we can execute them in the agility to make modifications when technology, you know, you think it might uh, be developed in this pathway and then you find some and discover some new things that now the warfighter is like, that is really cool. I would like to add that to the solution that you guys are trying to build. And so that agility and speed um, I think is amazing. And I think that's the appropriate risk that you take. And so 
to enable the warfighter and the acquisition community to leverage that is all about first in, you know, in educating people on the tools that exist. So there's the, the PIA, there's other transaction you know, uh, agreements. And so I think SOCOM does a very good job educating their enablers, their acquisition community, finance, and the program managers on these are the tools that are out there. Now we want you to go use them. So they provide that guidance and that top cover, like, let's go do this. Let's do something different. I think that's really important from the top down at SOCOM that enables you know, their enablers to execute these unique authorities to get things to the warfighter more quickly. Do you mind if I add something on that? Sure thing. Because I think one of the, the benefits of having the different organizations across the services is that because of what SOCOM does every day in many, many parts of the world, and the fact you don't have to scale, we do have to scale. And so we're able to take what's working, what's, what is helping units based off of what's changing very quickly um, and learn a whole lot from SOCOM that we can then, what are the things that would scale at a larger number to be able to help army forces? And, and again, I think this is where having this these partnerships across the, the Department of Defense is so absolutely important for all of us to do our jobs. I would also, I think that there's also the element that, you know, traditionally in acquisition, success is driven by and rewarded when an effort translates into a program of record. Mm -hmm. And in our world, we're able to identify based on direct input from the end user, the warfighter, what is this appropriate scale for this product, yeah. for this capability? Yes. Yeah. And it may be a leave behind capability. It may be a nominal amount because there's a program of record that's coming online in two, three years, and we just need a stopgap. Mm -hmm. Or it may warrant mm. a full transition to a program of record. The beauty in our approach is that those inputs from the end users are informing all the documentation to lay the foundation should it warrant a program of record transition, but it doesn't commit taxpayer dollars right up front. It, and it allows you to pivot when you need to pivot. Exactly. So, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the boat's going down the river and, you know, you think I'm going from point A to point B. Well, you might need to adjust as you go along. And in, in bureaucratic systems, that's often very difficult, right? And mm -hmm. you might you might find, you know, I can actually take 10% of the cost out of this if I make this small change and we say, oh, no, but you can't change the scope <laughs> right. and this kind of stuff. So that sounds, it sounds to me from my friends that I talk to, and I love Hondo Gertz and McRaven, et cetera. And I refer to them lovingly as uh, velvet hammers <laughs> because they're very smooth and they pound away, but they get results, <laughs> but they're going to keep pounding away, right? And I've had some other friends who are maybe a little more edgy and they just piss everybody off. But anyway, I saw so big fans of theirs and they've gotten huge results. And like you said, top down cover, they they provided the leadership to, and, and the force of personality and the leadership to, to make these things happen. But it seems that you're able to make changes in a, a program of record or make changes to things uh, uh, more quickly and more nimbly today than you could before. Before it seemed things were stuck in stone, were set in stone. Is, is that a fair assessment? Okay. Any any examples, or is, is is it just generally true? I think in general for SOCOM, you know, there's a lot of service providing capabilities, right? And so SOCOM is focused on developing those soft, unique, or benefit to soft capabilities that could potentially then transition to the services. And so it does help in terms of integrating new technologies to those platforms, um, as well as just integrating new technologies into their current programs of record. In addition to the you know traditional development for new capabilities that might be something um, a new program of record or a new um, you know capability to send downrange, so it, it does it because it, it proves it out. They're like, right. okay, we know it works. It doesn't work. Let's move forward. I think this comes back to the the matter of culture. There, mm -hmm. I, I in my experience, there are some program offices that are leaning very far forward and embracing the fact that, hey, we need to be nimble from a program office perspective also, because a change up front is gonna cost us, but it's gonna cost us a lot less here mm -hmm. than down the road when we've committed to this product line and our end user isn't even employing. Yeah. Or employing and you can't keep raising it a thousand times, right. but if it's critical, that judgment about let's go ahead and make this change because of what you just said, is vital and having the wherewithal to make that, that discernment is, is critical and having the license to do it. Right. Is and yeah, if you if you don't change it now, it's going to cost you way more down the yes. that that calculus has to be something that the that the the experts have to be able to uh, to, to act on. Yes. So you guys are like Q a little bit to me on 007, right? You're like the Q department where you come up with the cool gadgets and things like that, and then figure out how to make them, right? 
Um, what are the really interesting technologies, et cetera, that you guys are focused on? And, and yours, uh, I know more from the prototyping than the, the, uh, the development R&D side, but also the scale. What's coming online that you think may be making some of the biggest game changers? Are there any particular technologies from AI to whatever, to automated, you know, to non-manned? I mean, where should our military be focusing its resources in terms of its focus, in terms of uh, the technologies that will give us the biggest bang for the buck and maybe save the most lives? So I'll talk about near term. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think two of the priorities from Army Futures Command that we are really trying to work on that will have longer. So one of how are we using pairing human and machines? How are we integrating them mm -hmm. with informations? Um, so some of that is allowing AI to help from a decision support. So what are the things that could help commanders make more, better and faster decisions? Um, but then it's the, how do we allow machines to do what they're good at so that the commanders can spend more time on the values, the judgment. Um, and so there are things that we can do today. There are also with practice and the ability to test and have autonomy that right now there's a lot of rules against it. You know, how do we start getting the, the warfighters to practice with us because algorithms are gonna break machines are gonna break. How do we know what confidence we can have? So I think the human machine integration and the formations, that's something that we see the pairing, um, offsetting the, the risk and offsetting the work whenever possible. Um, the other that we're really focused on is from a, a communications perspective, the, the, the network. Um, being able to pass information across the Army, but not just with the Army. How do we make sure that we're passing information to the Navy and back? How do we make sure that you know, wherever that you are in the world, um, we're able to get things to people who need it in time to do something with it? Um, and so there's a lot of challenges within programs that we have where they're designed to work within kind of their silos. There's a whole lot of effort, I think, across everyone. But you know, how do we make sure that we can pass the digits? in time to those who need it to make decisions. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's me. I think from the SOCOM perspective, what we're seeing a lot of requests um, for help on is um, the environment that they're operating in, right? So for a very long time, special operations has been operating in austere location, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily with a lot of connectivity, but as they shift to maybe a different fight, now they're focusing on how do we operate in an urban environment where they can see and hear everything that we do. And so how do we mitigate and figure out how to operate in those different types of environments? Um, I would also say, um, you know, digital twinning um, is really important so that, you know, you can build something, um, you know, with zeros and ones. And then when you make modifications, you can kind of test and validate there first before maybe going into that prototype or whatever. So to be able to iterate more quickly on platforms and capabilities. Um, also, and will always be, you know, kind of first and foremost is, you know, battlefield care, you know, human performance for special operations. Again, whether that be now in austere locations or other types of environments, how do we take care of the warfighter, you know, um, more quickly? Yes. And that extends to all of the services as well. Yes. I think from us, we're seeing a lot in terms of an interest in uncrewed systems to reallocate our war fighters away from the dull, dirty, dangerous yeah. jobs uh, along those lines and with those uncrewed systems and capabilities, edge processing, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning in order to get a distributed set of capabilities while keeping in mind the need for a command and control in those mm -hmm. mission sets. And then I would say another one that we're seeing uh, now is advanced manufacturing. Mm. Uh, uh, technology advancing in the manufacturing of goods uh, as well as facilities. And how can we leverage those commercial capabilities and apply them toward the operational gains? And and, and, and cost as well. I mean, if, if we can double the number of these things that we could make for you, right? Regardless of their capability, that's obviously a win. So is, is much of your research or your effort in terms of you know, driving scale, et cetera, about how do we take out cost? I'm, I know innovation doesn't always think folks too much on cost, but innovating around cost uh, so that you can have more. I would say from our perspective, we look at what we do as a business of innovation. Mm -hmm. And so inherent in that is always the, the calculation of cost mm -hmm. and how can we offset costs? Primarily cost of life, but also cost of doing that business. Uh, and so it, it, 
when we do that, we're looking at the the ROI, the return on investment. Uh, and we we view innovation not strictly as a technical matter, but also a process oriented matter. Mm -hmm. So are there better ways, processes, workflows that we can employ, introduce some disruption that both helps us internally in our efficiency, but also offsets the decision calculus in our near peer competitors. And I think, so I'd say, of course, cost matters. Um, but, but I also think that, so part of when we use transformation, we're trying to say it's not just the material solution. And so how we organize from our formations and how we operate are some of the biggest changes that we also see. And so I think that's where for us having the concepts, how are we going to operate, organize and equip in the future? And material shouldn't be leading the answer, right? So, so we can use new technologies. We can also use existing technologies in very different ways. Um, and so I think we're trying to look at all of them um, and then how do we push forward from a science and tech perspective on what are those things that we really, we can't bring in different people or change our facilities or change our training. Like we actually need a technology to help us in this way. And so that way we're trying to look at the, the span of changes that are needed to be able to fight differently in the future. Well, ultimately, you're saving the taxpayer money, in my opinion, because yes. you're innovating faster, et cetera. You're coming yes. in with better solutions, and sometimes those solutions are less expensive, right, yes. and do more with less. Yes. And so the, I think the public needs to understand that yes. we need to support your work because not only are you saving lives, the big cost, et cetera, but uh, just selfishly from a dollar perspective, uh, every dollar that goes into to this kind of research and innovation, et cetera, and, and bringing capabilities out of faster um, uh, reduces the burden and you know, spend your money smart versus, yes. you know, let's be smart, not just uh, harder, right? Yes. I think so. So for instance, from a protection perspective and sustainment is also kind of a very huge category that has a lot of similarities, but, but one way to be more protected is to have super thick armor. Yeah. Or you could prevent yourself from being seen to begin with, <laughs> or you could be seen, but they wouldn't understand what you're trying to do, or they, or see, you are, or... they, they see you, but you have enough and have time to move so that the rounds hit someplace else. And so I think it's trying to, to see how do we not only use better technologies because we don't want anyone to ever get into a fair fight no. if you're an American sure. or an ally. Um, but I think it's also, it's not just about buying thicker armor. I appreciate you saying that because I, I remember a lot of the requirements used to be things like, uh, well, I want to be able to shoot. So I want a tank, excuse me. I want a tank that will kill somebody on top of a, a building a mile away. So no, you want somebody dead on that building. Yeah. Right. Right. There's a lot of ways to, to kill the bad guy on that building, right? Yes. It doesn't necessarily have to be a tank, right? Yes. But quite often, um, the innovator or whatever was told, you have to innovate it this way. Yes. And you worked at what you guys work backwards and, and focus on the um, the root. What is the problem trying to solve? And what's what what does the end look like? Yes. And I think we also recognize that across the services, a lot of those problem sets and needs mm -hmm. are very similar if not exact. Mm -hmm. And so it's imperative that we continue to share data across the services and across our organizations, because not only does that result in commonality in execution, but it directly affects how much the taxpayer's money is actually invested in those capabilities, mm -hmm. overall saving money for the taxpayer. And do you all have an annual convention where you all get together? No? Mm -hmm. I'll host that in Vegas. That's okay. Theater, right? yeah, this is, this is, this is, These are so great. We have to have all of you in the same room together, right? And we do have, so here in Austin, we actually have representation uh, from across yep. mm -hmm. the DOD X community. So DIU, That's this MIU, so important. Right. AFWorks, AAL, Naval X, Softworks. Uh, I mean, everyone is coming together and we recognize the benefit in leveraging each other's tools, capabilities, and even problem sets to inform our own. Yeah, any informal process, any formal process, excuse me, about how you share information. I know you get together, you talk, you meet, et cetera. I'm curious, you know, lessons learned, uh, 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 after action reviews, or I don't know what you, what you I would else would say call in it. in an ideal world, there would be a, a place where we could all push our information in so that we could leverage um, you brief each other what or each something. other is doing and partner. But there really isn't a single point where we can all push our information in and see kind of what everybody's doing. And we all have very specific customers, right? So we want to yeah. make sure we're serving our customers, but we do want to share. Back to your point that sometimes doing, they need is, is, is transferable across a different customer. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's tough. 
um, to be able to access all of that information. It's on, you know, either so your head's down, military you're, system you're doing your job every day, right? So it's tough to take time out also. To do yeah, that. absolutely. And I think while there's space for a formal quarterly engagement, right, the pace at which we all move is so rapid mm -hmm. that we don't want to anchor ourselves to the traditional mindset of, okay, we have a milestone at this date and time. We're trying to approach it in an innovative fashion. Mm -hmm. So we do have a joint innovation lab in Crystal City, Virginia, where there's representation mm -hmm. from across the services and we can ad hoc come together and engage on critical and relevant topics that support across the board. Yeah, I think it's it's also a big Venn diagram. So within the, the concepts community, we do the joint staff J7 the, writing, the joint war fighting concept and the services. We, we all talk on a fairly regular basis. Um, from an experimentation perspective, uh, we'll go to each other's war games. They're starting to get a little bit better. So the scientists, the scientists are working across all these different problems and so, could we do better? Is there a better way to do knowledge management? Absolutely. We also appreciate you hosting these sessions so that we're able to have excuses to get together to, to start having this collaboration right. more. Time. We'll have them anytime you want. That's great. <laughs> um, we've got about nine, 10 minutes left. Um, and my thought is if there were some, I'd like each of you maybe to say if there's one or two things you really want the public to understand, any messages that you'd really like to get out there um, that are most important and to help to enable your organizations to be even more successful, what kind of messages would you like the public, especially in the private sector, maybe in the investment community uh, or or the non-traditional solutions providers? What what messages would you like to get out? What, what, what would you like to get across to them? Um, I would say, you know, cast your net wide. Um, really learn about what each service does, what each innovation hub, who their customer is. And, um, you know, trying to at least identify where your technology, if you're a solutions provider, would fit and who that best customer might be um, in terms. So casting your net wide in terms of doing the research, but then kind of narrow it down and focus on, you know, doing that one thing very well for your customer, because if you do that, then it, it will propagate um, across the services, I believe. Um, and that to, you know, please reach out to us. If you have questions directly, go to our website because there's a lot of good information, uh, but we know it's not perfect. And so if you have questions, don't be afraid to, you know, pursue, engagement opportunities with the government stakeholders and you do have to be persistent um, as much as we like to you know respond as quickly as possible um, you know there's there's some delays but so be persistent um, you know startups not for sissies uh, I would say <laughs> far-based contracts are not for sissies yeah. but you really do have to you know, be persistent and build those relationships. And and we're trying to do our best to help build those relationships. So the grit would tell out. the military would tell us that grit is an important characteristic to, to have, <laughs> Absolutely. right? Absolutely. I mean it's it's a I think it's a tough environment. Mm -hmm. Um but we really appreciate all the uh you know the the solutions providers and investors that do want to support national security and, and special operations command and uh we're willing to do the hard work with you um to help your capabilities support the warfighter. So I'd say um, there are so many challenges that do have dual use application. Um, and so again, the information protection sustainment, I mean, just from a sustaining perspective, our country has some of the, the leading logistics organizations. And so we are going to be all operating in a very distributed manner um, and across land, across very large areas. And so I think um, it, if there are challenges that exist, there's probably a likely application within the military. I think the second thing is I'd ask is please protect your information. Mm -hmm. um, it's like boxing so your hands up you and you get to with a great idea, and that actually may speed up others uh, stealing it or applying it in different ways. And so I would say that uh, that is one thing that I think is worth investing. Um, the last thing is is that just. To, uh, being assured that that how we all intend to to use this uh, to um, to be able to to keep uh, to do our part um, overseas um, it is we take it very seriously um, and so um, we are not designing terminators to go out and, and do terminator things um, and so I think being able to have that that confidence in working with us having that patience um, is that we need to start practicing now. So that by the time we get to 2040, we aren't trying to pull something out of a mill van and say, how does this work again? Um, yeah. Right. Thank you for that. Yes, sir. I, I mean, I would echo what my colleagues are saying here um, and completely support what they've shared. Uh, engage with us. Right. So 
from our perspective, go on usnavalx.com, join our network. If it's not for uh, the Navy or Marine Corps, we are happy to connect you with the other services because we are a community of interest mm -hmm. uh, and we do share data securely. Yes. Right. So, <laughs> uh, and I would say, I would just amplify that diversity in thought, experience, and technology is critical to our success here. So uh, we have to, our focus is equipping our warfighters with the needed capabilities at the pace of relevance. In order to do that, we have to approach the problems humbly, mm -hmm. recognize that sometimes we need to get out of each other's ways in, in order to help each other advance for the collective whole. Yeah. Sure. So we just got two or three more minutes. Um, I just want to say thank you to each of you because you've dedicated your lives to something that is vitally important. Um, national security, clearly, a vital support, but uh, but uh, putting capabilities in the hands of the warfighter faster, breaking through bureaucracy, innovating faster, changing the way we innovate. Um, we cannot outmuscle our near-peer adversaries, right? There are 1.4 billion of them, and they're, up, they're pretty smart, right? So we have to innovate faster and America's capability, and you guys might finish on this, but I think our unique capability is that we are innovators inherently, et cetera, right? And uh, we need to play to our strength. And uh, and if we don't do that, um, just on a sheer numbers game, yep. we lose, right? Yep. Yep. Well, I want to say thank you. We're, we're going to close now, et cetera, let you guys get back to the business of protecting our nation and, and, and enabling our warfighters. I can't thank you enough for being here. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.